She's back! Hello and welcome to my channel. I am so excited that you are here to review this week's lesson with me. We are going to be talking about love and devotion. Listen, there is no better feeling in the world than knowing that someone has your back. It is comforting to know that no matter what life brings, you have someone that you can rely on. And we're going to talk about that in today's video. Let's go. Sunday, 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 Sunday. Sunday, 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 Sunday. Welcome to the International Sunday School lesson entitled Love and Devotion. My name is Waynell Henson, and you know me as that Sunday School girl for five years. I've been in this space changing the way that people see Sunday School. I have missed you all so very much. I appreciate the love and the support that I receive on this channel, and I am so grateful to an incredible community of people around me who support this work and pray for this work, and not only that, but support in ways that are very, very tangible. And so before I get into the lesson, I do want to thank Mr. Kristen Gio, who sat in this seat for me for the last two weeks. Uh, the first week, honestly, I was pushing into Step Summit, and that was a part of the plan. But in week two, he was that friend who said, this is what is going to happen, because I will kind of push and push and never take a break. And he said, no, this is how we're going to handle this, to give you some time to somewhat recover. So I am appreciative of those who helped to preserve my strength. I want to be able to serve you for a long time to come. So thank you. I loved reading the comments. And he's an amazing teacher, so I'm actually curious. Let me know in the comments. Don't y'all think that Mr. Kristen should do this for us once a month? I think so. Let me know what you think, and maybe we can talk him into a once-a-month guest appearance. But again, I'm so happy that you are here. If you're new around here, allow me to say welcome. You have just joined the largest cyber community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web. I think we're approaching like 33,000 subscribers, which, again, for a Sunday school channel, this is not makeup or anything else. But this is studying the word of God, preparing for Sunday school. So it's a wonderful community. I know you'll be blessed. Look down below. I want you to get subscribed. Be sure to click that button. Also click the bell so that you get notifications every time there is content uploaded on this channel. We're currently going live at least twice a week, and we're uploading this video as a review. So we start on Markup Monday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. I go live here. And hundreds of teachers, students, leaders, Christian education leaders join from all over the world as a preview of the week's lesson. And then we come back at either this video to review or maybe you join me live on Sunday mornings if you're not back into your traditional settings yet to actually review the lesson. I also do a review for young people that sort of puts it in their language in a conversation they understand. And you can find a number of resources on my website. So again, so glad you're here. Everybody do this for me. Everybody, everybody, everybody. I need you to click that thumbs up like button. Please do that for me. That lets YouTube know the kind of content that you enjoy. And yes, it also encourages me along the way. And of course, at any point in the lesson, you are welcome to use the box down below to drop a comment. I enjoy reading those. I want to say very briefly again, thank you to those of you who attended Step Summit 2020. If you missed it, we missed you. It was exhilarating. It was amazing. It was incredible. There were more than 300 people that joined us in a virtual space for two days of Sunday school training and equipping. And the survey feedback is more than 98% positive. People enjoyed the Step Summit and I've enjoyed the messages that teachers are already using the tools in their classes and creating the engagement and they're refreshed and they're excited. And I'm almost brought to tears when I think about that because that's what this work is all about. I'm not just here to give you the answers to the lesson for the week, but I want Sunday school to grow and to thrive where you are. Listen, I have one big announcement and I'm going straight to the lesson, but you asked, you helped, and it is here. This is the first time that I've spoken publicly about it, but you can go now to your iTunes store or Google Play, and you can download the brand new 
TSSG app. It's been away for a while and we had to revamp and refresh, but I asked you earlier this year for your help and you help through your contributions. I appreciate all the support that you give financially and every dollar of it goes to equip this ministry to better serve you and to put the tools in your hands to do the work to which God is called. So get it downloaded. Enjoy. I can't wait to hear what you think about it. But for now, I need you to get your Bibles, your pens, handy dandy notebooks, your TSSG notes if you want those are always the first link in the description box down below. We are about to get into the lesson. Our lesson title is Love and Devotion. The Bible basis is 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. The Bible truth. Jonathan intercedes for his friend David by speaking to his father, King Saul, on David's behalf. Our memory verse is verse 4. And the lesson aim is that we will explore the story of Jonathan's defense of David when David was opposed by Saul, long for love and justice within family and beyond, and grow in love and devotion for justice for others. I'm going to move a little bit differently this week by beginning with the full reading of our printed text from 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. And Saul spake unto Jonathan his son and to all the servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning and abide in a secret place and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art. And I will commune with my father of thee. And what I see, that I will tell thee. And Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father and said unto him, let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee. And because his works have been to thee word very good, for he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine. And the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it and did rejoice. Wherefore then will thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan and Saul swear as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David and Jonathan showed him all the things and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. As we go into this lesson, I again say that it is meaningful. It matters when someone will stand for you, when they will speak for you. And I hope that as you have studied this lesson, or perhaps as we walk it out together in this lesson, you will think about meaningful friendships that God has allowed you to have, very deep friendships like we will see with Jonathan and David, and that you might also be able to reflect on when someone has stood up for you, when they have spoken for you, or perhaps even be provoked and challenged for how you might be that one who can stand up for someone else. In the book of 1 Samuel, we have a period of about 130 years that covers the time from the leadership of Samuel through the death of King David. In this passage, we have several characters. We have King Saul, who was the son of a wealthy man, a very handsome man, tall and striking. He once served the Lord, had a good heart, but got a little bit off track. And in fact, the Lord's presence was eventually lifted from him. And then we have David, who himself was another handsome man who was musical and intelligent, loyal and brave. He was resourceful and God blessed him. He was successful in battle. And he was also a musician who had the ability to calm Saul, King Saul, to soothe him through the playing of his instruments. Now we could easily talk about David and Saul, but we've got to kind of do the drive-through version so that we can get to the focal point of this week's lesson. David was loved by many people and he was loved by God. And you'll hear me mention again and again that the Lord was with David and that made a difference. So I mentioned that he was brought to 
play before the king, to sue the king when he would get out of sorts, these evil spirits that would come upon him. But David is also the boy who was a shepherd. He was the young boy out in the back tending his father's sheep when the prophet was sent to anoint the next king. And all of his brothers were brought out before and the oil would not flow until the father says, well, I've got one more son. Now he's out back tending sheep. He looks like sheep. He smells like sheep. He sings to the sheep. He talks to the sheep. And when David was brought out, he was the one who was anointed. The oil flowed and he was anointed as the next king. That didn't happen immediately. There were some things that had to happen in David's life and God used all of those experiences to develop David into what he had already spoken about him. In fact, David was sent um, as a boy to go and to check on his brothers and to take them food. And while he was on that journey, as he approached and got with his brothers, they were being taunted by Goliath, the nine foot six inch tall giant that would come and tease and taunt the Jews. And he would tease them about their God and what their God was capable of doing. And David, as a little guy, didn't understand that. In fact, he demanded an answer. Isn't there a cause? Is there anything worth fighting for? Is there anybody who will go and fight this uncircumcised Philistine? You know what? I am not afraid of a giant. David, as a little boy, as a young boy, volunteered to be the one who would go and stand against a very big enemy. And you know what? He figured this. I fought off animals from my father's flock. I fought a lion. I fought a bear. What is it for me to go and to fight this giant? And God gave him the victory using his slingshot and three smooth stones. In fact, when he returns, he has Goliath's head in his hand. If you look at chapter 18 going into our lesson this week, you'll find that Saul has now had this sort of changing relationship that happens with David. If you read through that, um, Saul brings David into a full-time assignment with him, and he knows that there is something about him. In fact, he, let's just be honest, he's feeling threatened. He understands that the man in front of him, the boy, the young man, is the one who threatens his, his leadership as the king. He knows that there is something about him that God's hand is upon him. And then there's Jonathan. Let's not leave him out. He's basically a prince, but he is uh, someone who loves David. They develop a very special friendship. And again, if you've ever had a best friend, if you've ever had that covenant friend that no matter what, even beyond the grave, you are committed to that person in your friendship, you understand the friendship of Jonathan and David. I am blessed to have had that kind of friend. One of my uh, best friends, in fact, my sorority line sister, um, her children's godmother passed away when we were 35, I think years old, 36 years old, and beyond the grave. It's been 11 years since that time, but I am committed to our friendship. I remain committed to her children. I am blessed to still be connected with her family. That is what I always think about as I study these lessons on David and Jonathan, to know that you can have that kind of friendship in this life. And so even Jonathan knew that there was something special about his friend. He knew it and he understood that he as a prince he was never going to be king, but he believed in David. He even gave him his robe, his armor, and his sword. There was a covenant relationship between the two of them. But Saul, again, had this sort of, ah, it was a love-hate. It was a, a changing relationship with David. And ultimately, he has it out for David. He Whatever it takes, he wants to get at David. He wants to take David off of the scene. But we learn in chapter 18, verse 15, we start to see this refrain that David behaved wisely. And every assignment that he was given, he behaved wisely. But Saul, 
who had this thing in his heart, and let's just pause there and have a life conversation. There are sometimes things that end up in our hearts that we cannot ignore because when you ignore a thing, it can grow into something deeper. And that's what we're going to see developing here. It happens even throughout chapter 18. You see that he is that thing that's inside of Saul. He so wants to get at David that he even sends him out to war against the Philistines. His goal was surely he'll get killed out there in battle. But guess what? That didn't work either. He defeated his enemy, not a little bit, but with a great victory. And people recognize the victories. They recognize the success of David. In fact, he basically becomes a national hero. He is celebrated to the point that women begin to sing in the streets. They sing his name and they say that Saul slayed his thousands, but David slayed ten thousands. And from that day on, from that moment, if you look at chapter 18, verse nine, you'll see that Saul basically side-eyed David from that day on. There was contempt in his heart for him. And as you read through chapter 18, that feeling turns into a thought. And that thought grows into something much bigger to the point that he begins to take action on his deep-seated, nasty, ugly feelings toward David. Remember, David played his instrument before Saul to soothe him. So in his hand, he had an instrument that would bring healing. But Saul sitting there had an instrument in his hand. Whereas David's instrument brought healing, Saul's instrument was intended to bring hurt. How do I know that? Well, he actually throws the instrument in his hand, a spear. He throws it twice at David while he is playing with the attempt to take his life. A spear could have killed David, but both times in chapter 18, David avoids being hit. As we read through, I believe way up through chapter 20, you see that there are a number of attempts that Saul uses, not only his own efforts with the spear, but sending David into battle, even using his own daughter as bait. Letting David know that to have my daughter, it will cost you. Uh, you got to go out there and kill 100 Philistines. He just knew that was going to get David killed, but wrong again. So what I want you to stay focused on as we get into our printed text is that Saul is dealing with jealousy. He is dealing with feeling threatened. And the one thing that he cannot come against is the fact that the Lord was with David. And it's problematic that people think highly of David. Saul hates it and his hate bubbles up. It bubbles over in chapter 19. This is no longer, you know, it's no longer a thought that was in his head, but now we see his full bitterness on display. The heart of Saul is on display. Perhaps in chapter 18, you could argue that it was a hidden agenda, but in chapter 19, Saul's bitterness has gone public. We can literally see now, now you can't see what's inside of a person by looking from the outside. People can shroud a lot of things, but here his actions and not just his actions, but his words become very clear with how he feels about David and what he wants to happen. He wants to see David gone. And feelings change and I give you all of these details in the TSSG notes, but there was a time that Saul actually loved David, but his concerns took him to a fear of David. And now he's in a position where he views David as his enemy. Luke 6 45 tells us that good and evil is in the heart. That's the source of the good and evil in us. In fact, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We are very clear of the bitter root in the heart of Saul. Now that's an order. He orders the people around him. He orders the resources. Think about it. He is the king who has the power to command resources and all of the national capability. His focus should have been on deploying those resources to protect his nation. But instead, he focuses his energy, his effort, his intent on one man. And he gives specific instruction. In fact, he puts a hit 
on the life of David. He orders them to the crime, the specific intent crime of murder. The deliberate and exact instruction to take his life is given to Jonathan and to his servants. But Jonathan does not feel the same way that his father does. In fact, this puts Jonathan in a tough spot. And sometimes we find ourselves in difficult places where we have two different interests that pull on us. And so this is a critical moment and a critical situation because Jonathan sits in the middle. On the one hand, he definitely wants to please his father. In fact, when he tells David about the issue, he refers to Saul as my father three times. Now pay attention because he says my father when he talks to David, but when he deals with Saul, he deals with him as a subject or as a subordinate. But he wants to please his father, but at the same time, he has this love and a covenant friendship, a covenant relationship with David. He is not in support of this hit on his friend's life. He does not want to do harm to the friend that he loves. So what do we see here in this moment of personal conflict? As we talk about love and devotion, love is actionable. Someone who is devoted to you will take action. When you are devoted to someone, you are willing to take action. In fact, willing to make a sacrifice. Jonathan is willing to make a sacrifice. He is willing to take a personal risk for David, in the interest of David. How do I know that? Well, because Jonathan had a choice. He had a choice to tell David or not what his father had planned. And Jonathan also knows that his father can be very hot-headed. He already knows that his father has no respect of person. He knows that his father will even threaten his own life. You have references for that as well in the notes. So he knows what he's dealing with. And yet he is willing to take that risk for his friend. Someone who is devoted to you is willing to take a risk. So what does he do? He takes a risk and he gives David a warning. He tells David about the plans of Saul for him and that he wants his friend to be saved. He chooses devotion of a friend over his father, relationship over blood, and he has a plan. His plan was that he wants to listen. He wants to gather more about sort of his father's headspace and where he is and what the plan is. But now while he gets more information, he needs his friend to be in protective custody. So the plan was this. You are going to go and hide in a secret place until the morning. And I'm going to go and hang out with my father in the field. And I'm going to talk to him. And I'm going to let you know what it is that I find out. We next see that Jonathan becomes an advocate. And I want to spend some time here because this for me was sort of the heart of where this devotion comes in. Some lesson titles say that he intercedes for David. What is an advocate? An advocate offers independent support. They are the voice or someone who will stand up for the rights of another person. They will help people help themselves. Now, a good advocate is going to be a good listener. They're going to be supportive. They're gonna have all the necessary information and they are going to be a good representative and a good advocate is going to keep solid records and will not be intimidated. Let's look at how we see Jonathan as an advocate for David. The first thing is he has a courageous conversation. And in this, he makes a plea to his father to reconsider. He honors his father actually by even having the conversation, but he challenges his dad on the why. Why is it that you have such an interest in killing David? There were only kind things that Jonathan would speak about David to his father. He speaks well of him. And again, it is meaningful when you have someone who will speak well of you in your absence. We all benefit when someone will say your name in a space where you are not standing. And he takes up for David. He tries to talk his father out of any planned harm against David. And he really sets up a very solid argument. This is really good lawyering here. He says, you should not kill David 
for three reasons. Number one, Jonathan establishes these facts. Argument number one, it is sin. What you have in your heart to do, the thing that you have planned, that that you've been stewing on is sin. As an advocate, he takes a risk. He stands up and in this courageous conversation, the very first thing he does in his own father, in his leader, was to call out bad behavior. He expressly challenges sin. In fact, sin is mentioned three times, I believe, in verse four, three and once in verse, oh, I'm sorry, in verse four and once in verse five. He talks about sin. He does not affirm the negativity or the hatred in the heart of the king. This was an aha for me. We must be courageous in calling out bad behavior, bad decisions, bad thought processes in truth and in love even to those that we know and have relationship with. We cannot be afraid to speak against things that are not right. Again, when we do it in truth and in love. Argument number two, he's innocent. He has not done a thing to you. He's not done a thing that would even, there's no crime that he's committed that would even justify the taking of his life. As a matter of fact, here's argument number three. He's been nothing but helpful to you. He has been a benefit. Argument three is that David has been a benefit. He's put his life on the line for you, for these people. He uh, accomplishes David's record of good works and even his successes in battle. He's been willing to put his life on the line fighting the Philistines. He has been the instrument that God has used to defeat enemies. And guess what? When we were winning, you were happy about that. And so he concludes by saying, you don't have a cause. There is no reason. He pushes Saul really to answer the question. So why is it that you are really even feeling this way? And that's a whole nother conversation. Sometimes when we are feeling off about things or we have pushed into a place that our own minds have taken us that may not even be true, you need someone who will push you to really search out your thoughts, really search out the emotion in a thing to ask you the tough questions and to push you to your why. So Jonathan is an advocate for David. And you know what? We're making messianic connections in this quarter. There is a connection that we can make here too, because we have an advocate. We have an advocate in the father. We have an advocate through Christ Jesus, and he will plead our cause. And he gives all the reasons why we deserve to be fought for. Here was another aha. God can and will put the right people in the right place to be the advocate that we need so that his purpose is accomplished in our lives. This was also sort of a wow for me. This was a very logical and methodical way for Jonathan to approach Saul. And it was interesting because he makes a rational argument to someone who's behaving irrationally. So there's a caution there. Bitterness can push you beyond reason, and it will even cause you to justify your own bad decisions. But Jonathan confronts that in his father. And you know what? Advocacy works. How do I know that? Because there is an agreement that's actually reached. Jonathan shows extraordinary efforts and commitment to David. He shows his love. He shows his devotion by being willing to stand for him. And Saul listened to his son and he swore not to take the life of David as long as he lived. And, uh, you know, he's not exactly able to keep that promise. And we'll talk about that in a second. But here for this, pur for this purpose, um, in this moment, Jonathan is satisfied to the point that he goes back to David, tells David everything, and he's comfortable bringing David back into Saul's presence and continuing business as usual, being in his presence as he was in the past. Now, I view this as risky business. I use hashtag risky business um, because it takes 
um, some doing to go back into the presence of someone when the relationship has been challenged. It takes some doing to go back into the presence of someone when you know that they are not exactly excited to have you there. And let's just be honest, it would take something to go back into the presence of Saul when you know that he not only put the hit out on you, but he's been throwing spears. But the life of David, all of this was a part of the plan of God. And we talked about that last week, um, looking even through the life of Joseph, things that didn't make sense, things that were uncomfortable through the human lens in the mind of God are his plan being worked out in our lives. And that's exactly what happens here with David. All of the craziness, the things that don't make sense are actually a part of the journey that God takes David through as he moves him to the leadership of King. Now, again, Saul makes this promise and it's one that he cannot keep. In fact, David ends up on the run for more than seven years, even past the death of Jonathan running from Saul. But God never allowed him to be delivered into Saul's hands. And so God was always faithful. God is always faithful in my life, in your life. His sovereignty is on display, even in the things that challenge us and in the things that we don't understand. But for this week, I want you again to think about the friendships. Think about who, in fact, I'm a person who has Uh, I keep my circle very tight with family and very trusted friends. I keep that very tight, uh, but my relationships are very deep. So I have a small circle that is very deep. And I challenge you to think about who's in your circle. Who can you depend on? Who advocates for you? Who do you know will speak well of you? Who do you know that you will speak for? And I also challenge you to think about who are you assigned to be an advocate for? Who should you be helping? How has God, why why does God allow you into certain places, into certain spaces? How are you to use your voice and your influence in a way that may benefit someone else? You know what? You You can't be a person who is petty or feel threatened if you're going to be an advocate. Because you know what? Just like Jonathan, Jonathan knew he was never going to be king. And yet he was willing to advocate for a person who would have the role that others may have thought that he should have had. Let me go through my key learnings and we're gonna wrap this lesson. The first thing is that we all get offended. It is a part of life, it is going to happen. If it hasn't already, my daddy used to say, just keep living. We can all get offended, but the thing that we have to watch for is not allowing a bitter root to set up in our heart. That was what happened with Saul when he allowed the ugly thoughts and emotions to sit and to fester, it became so much more that was ultimately played out, not just in his mind, not just in his emotions, but in his words and in his actions. And we must guard against that. Next is that we are all agents of free will. As we look at each one of these characters in the story, what we see is that everyone had choices. Saul had choices in how to deal with the offenses in his world. David had choices in how to respond with Jonathan. Jonathan had choices in trying to please his father or to be loyal to his friend. We always have choices. But what we've also got to watch for is acting through bitterness and acting through pain. I thought this was interesting. Difficult times are like a filter. They will reveal who is for you and who will speak for you, but they will also reveal the people who don't have kind things to say about you. Difficulty is a filter. It reveals who is for and who is against you. The next thing I want you to know, though, is that you can be an advocate You can stand for someone. Who is it that can benefit by your boldness? Perhaps it's as simple as advocating for someone who's in your family, and it may be as big as some of the movements that we see around us in the world concerning social justice. As a matter of fact, this is a great space for me to advocate and ask you, are you registered to vote? Your vote, your choice, your right should be exercised as a citizen in this democracy. You have a voice and I am advocating for you to use your voice. 
Perhaps you are looking around at some of the causes concerning social justice and the value placed on lives, specifically the value of black lives. And you might find yourself being willing to be an advocate in one of the social justice movements. I want you to know that we can be advocates for causes that matter to us. Next, we should know that we, like David, are targets of the enemy. But just like God protected David from spears and in battle and even against the plot using his wife, God can and will protect us. Finally, like David, even in our difficulty, we must be assured that the sovereign will, the sovereign work of God is at play in our lives and he will guide us in all that we do. The last thing I wanna share is I found a very interesting blog this week as I was looking at what does it mean to be devoted um, as a friend? What does it mean to have devotion to another? And this uh, blog argued that there are three reasons why devoted people are happier. And I absolutely see um, these three things present in the lesson. First is that devoted people are all in. That means that they are committed. And as I look at the relationship with Jonathan and David, they were all in. There was nothing half-hearted about their intent toward each other. They were not wishy-washy. He was all in and put in his best efforts to help in a situation where his friend was threatened. Secondly, devoted people tend to be focused people and you can't focus on 50 different things. It's better to be devoted to something or a few things and be all in and be very focused on those things so that you can concentrate and develop the discipline and the intentionality toward that thing. Finally, devoted people tend to be able to persevere. We tend to be able to hang in there when things are difficult, hang in there when you want to get weary. And even when the journey gets difficult, you have this ability to push on. And I see all of that present in this devotion in friendship. So again, I pray that you will find a way that you can show your love and show your devotion to someone but most of all, I pray that you will be the beneficiary of knowing what it feels like to be loved and having the comfort and support of knowing that someone is devoted to you. And if nothing else, know that we do have an advocate in the Father who loves us and was devoted to us even to the cross. His devotion toward us was so much so that he was willing to give his very life to make that sacrifice, whereas an advocate will make a sacrifice, he was willing to sacrifice for us so that we would become the beneficiaries. That is our lesson this week. I do pray that something was helpful. Again, if you can go out or if you're on YouTube, if you can go out to YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to this channel and do click that thumbs up like video for this week. I love you all and I'll see you next time. I'll see you in Sunday school. Bye everybody. Bag makes a great incentive gift or maybe a gift for your favorite Sunday school teacher. If you like it or want to see some other great stuff, please visit my Etsy store. If you're looking for ways to raise the conversation and open up discussion, please look down in the description box below and you'll find the discussion questions that I've developed for this week's lesson. Sunday school with that Sunday